Okay, so what, um, what's going to happen today is that Robert Miller, right there, is going to talk about graph theory. And he has a presentation prepared. He's also the uh, grader for the course and the TA. So in case you don't know, there he is. Um, what's your office in Pedelford? Uh, C406. C406. What are your office hours? Um, Tuesday and Thursday. You're more likely to find me in the math lounge. Okay, math lounge. On the second, I've changed the schedule slightly. On Monday, instead of talking more about graph theory, since you, in fact, will have seen a whole week of combinatorics this week, what we're going to do instead is have a um, coding and design sprint in class for one intense hour on Monday. And if you have a laptop, you might want to bring it. If you have reading materials related to the project you want to work on, um, bring those. Um, it'll be a good opportunity for you to talk to other people in the class about your project, to talk to me about your project, to just have a focused hour to think about your project, et cetera. So I'll make sure to bring a couple of power strips um, and so on. And if you have no idea what you'll do your project about, make sure to bring a blank piece of paper or something. <laughs> or bring your laptop in and uh, a web browser, and you can just start Googling for random ideas. Um, so that's what we'll be doing on Monday. OK? Is that OK with everybody? All right, great. So be ready to, to work hard on Monday. Um, all right, so without further ado, here is Robert. Um, OK, so uh, to start with, so is everyone OK if I erase? So I wanted to start with the definition of a graph for those of you who have seen it before, just really quickly. Um, so a graph, graph G is a set. subsets of V of size 2. Um, the alternate definition is you can say that a digraph, well, this is another, this is still a set V, but now you have E as a subset of the Cartesian product, V cross V. Um, so in the first one, order doesn't matter. Right? UV is the same thing as VU, and the second one, order matters. So you allow loops in the first one? Um, I'm not going, going to today, because I don't okay. need to talk about them. Um, but you know, like with a lot of definitions, you can see this and say, OK, well, how can I tweak this? How can I tweak that? You can define graphs with multiple edges in the same place, or loops on vertices, or you can generalize the notion of edges to a higher number. Those are called hypergraphs. Um, but today, I'll just be talking about um, non-looped, non, nothing special about them, um, graphs and digraphs. So, um, there's a definition. Oh, uh, I should also go over what morphisms look like. So anytime you learn about a new mathematical object, you learn about the objects themselves and then what are the maps to. So so graph homomorphism. Uh, let's say B from G to G prime, so I'll say G is the vertex, ver the vertex set is V and the edge set is E, and G prime will be V prime, E prime. So it's a map from the vertex set of one to the vertex set of the other, such that V of any edge is an edge. So this is the, the short, concise definition, but what does this mean? This means that it just maps vertices to vertices, and if you have an edge, um, each vertex on that edge gets sent to some vertex over here. And the only requirement is that where the edge should land is actually an edge. Um, so for example, um, over here, um, is there a graph homomorphism from five cycle to the four cycle. <coughs> C 
see one head shaking. Why not? Or a difference. Um, well, one way you could do it is say, okay, let's say this vertex maps here, right? Then each of these two vertices have to map somewhere here. Um, so there, there is a graph homomorphism from the six cycle to the three cycle. So you can just wrap it around twice. Um, that'll work, but going from the five cycle to the four cycle because the numbers aren't compatible, you can kind of show that. So, um, so the software demo. Um, the graph constructor just comes with a capital G. Um, if you don't give it any arguments, you get the empty graph. Um, but you can quickly add edges and vertices and things to make it interesting. Um, so that's one way to go about it. Um, another simple way of constructing a graph is to take a dictionary. So when I type one goes to the list, Probably two, three, you four. Edges, you haven't already added vertices, right? So by application, the vertices are in there? Exactly. So when you add an edge, it, it actually considers the edge as the edge and the two vertices if they're not there. Um, so another concise way to specify a graph when you're creating it is to um, give a dictionary and you just say, when I say one maps to the list, two, three, four, that means there's an edge one, two, one, three, and one, four. So you get the idea. Um, there's also some named graphs. So you say graphs.tab and it'll give you a whole bunch of different um, types of graphs. So um, here's the Peterson graph. Um, there's also a digraphs constructor. So you can say digraphs.tab and get some digraphs. Um, those aren't as, there aren't as many digraphs, but you can, you can say, um, so, so you can also call graphs and digraphs just um, as constructors themselves. So I just told you what a graph homomorphism is. You can imagine what an isomorphism is. It's one of these that has an inverse. So it's basically um, a map from one vertex set to another so that it forms a bijection on the vertices and on the edges. Um, so this splits the set of all graphs into isomorphism classes. Um, and what you get when you say graphs of four or digraphs of four are just um, one representative from each isomorphism class, so like the different types of graphs that you can have, or the different structures. Um, so. We made G a random directed, so this is a random directed GN, which means a growing network. Um, so the idea is that you start with a vertex and you randomly add vertices pointing inward towards what you already have. So at each point, you just randomly pick some vertex and point it to that one. Um, so there's also uh, compact formats for dealing with graphs. So um, since G is a digraph, it's got a, a dig six string. There's also a graph six string for graphs. And this is just a, a very concise, short way of, of sort of packing and shipping graphs around on, on the computer. Um, so in particular, if you want to make a digraph from one of these strings, you just say digraph of the string, and you get it back. Um, so this is a digraph that um, I, I, I used the, the growing network thing to get, so it, it was random, but um, then I gave it a partition, so I wanted to hang on to it. So um, this is a, an example of, oh, the colors are really bad. What is it you do, um, slide uh, talk equals true? Yeah, but I wanted to show the colors here, uh, that, that doesn't want white. But uh, you can sort of see, if it weren't for the sunlight, you could see better that, that these are split up into colors and that no edge contains two vertices of the same color. So that's called a, uh, a graph coloring. Um, so that's one of the things that you might want to look at when you're studying graphs. Um, another thing that might be of interest is um, the, the matrices associated with graphs. So the adjacency matrix has um, n rows and n columns, where n is the number of vertices. And the number of edges between two vertices is in between vertex i and vertex j is the entry in entry ij. So um, p is a graph, which means that its adjacency matrix is symmetric. vi vj has an edge if only if vj vi has an edge. Um, so these these give you some pretty interesting information about the the graph actually because you can think of 
Um, you know, Jim, for example, thinks of, of graphs often as electrical networks, where you have, um, correct me if I get the terms wrong, but you have a certain amount of voltage at each at each place. Um, yeah, at each at each vertex you have a certain amount of voltage, and each edge has a corresponding resistance or um, conductivity, which is like the inverse of resistance. Um, but if you think about a graph as an electrical network, then these adjacency matri matrices sort of say, okay, if I have a voltage at every vertex, that's like a vector. And it's a vector of length n, so when I multiply it by this matrix, basically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm moving voltages around the edges that are available. So if I have um, voltage only at vertex zero, that means I've got v comma zeros as my vector. And when I multiply it by the matrix, I get uh, zero v, zero zero, v v, and then zeros, um, and you can think of that as the voltage sort of moving along the edge to its neighbors. And if the if the edges have weightings, then you can sort of think of that as as the resistance being applied at the same time. Um, so there's there's a conjecture um, that the characteristic polynomial of a graph, which is the the characteristic polynomial of the JCC matrix, there's a conjecture that um, graphs are isomorphic if and only if they have the same uh, characteristic polynomial. Um, no one's, you know, really? no one's found a counterexample, but there's no really good reason to believe it either, except that it's it's good at telling them apart so far. Is it yeah. checked up to all graphs on n vertices for any value of n? <laughs> yes, for any n. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think you have to you have to stop pretty soon because there are just so many graphs and it's pretty hard to test. Well, how far can you go? Um, you should actually ask Kalman about this because he, like a, he worked with um, with uh, wow. Gordon Royal on this conjecture pretty heavily. He, he huh. did some computations with determinants and things for a while. They did not find a counterexample. Uh -huh. um, they were probably looking at very big graphs in certain families or something. Strongly regular graphs on lots of vertices. Mm -hmm. um, but as you can see, the characteristic polynomial of the graph is just the characteristic polynomial of the adjacency matrix. Um, the Kirchhoff matrix is a little bit more friendly to the um, the electrical network interpretation because the sum of every row or every column is zero. So there's it's sort of more balanced in the sense that um, you know row one means that so you put okay so the Kirchhoff matrix by definition is you put the degree of each vertex down the diagonal and then you subtract the adjacency matrix. Um, the other thing you you can also just think of it as filling in the diagonals to make all the rows sum to zero. But that means that uh, there's something sort of harmonic about that because that means that the source, which is vertex zero, is giving away three, and each of its neighbors is picking up one. So, um, and if you look at the the roots of the characteristic polynomial of the Kirchhoff matrix, you'll see that the, um, the roots are zero, five, and two. And I mean. Maybe this is numerology, but there seems to be a lot of fives and twos in there. So if you can, <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, the any any rotation, or, or you know, rotation is an order five um, automorphism of the graph. An automorphism is just an isomorphism to itself, as it always is. Um, but then you can also sort of turn it inside out and figure out where the cycles go. That's another automorphism. Um, so. To motivate the, the study of graph spectra a little bit, um, I took this function called class graph, which takes all of the classes in Sage and sort of gives you a directed graph with an edge representing each inheritance. So for example, Sage objects are objects. So there's an arrow. Um, I don't know, there's lots of other examples, but I can't think of any. Uh, the graph is a Sage object, so there's an arrow there too. Um, so what I did was I created the graph that corresponds to this. Um, there's 1,757 uh, classes in Sage 3.0. Um, I got the Kirchhoff matrix of that. I converted it to a, a dense matrix over the um, uh, complex double field by Williams' advice, and I computed its eigenspaces. Um, so the idea is that somehow the eigenvalues associated with these vectors should tell me something special about um, the connectivity of the graph and how things are, are connected. Um, this is a billion dollar eigenvector, of course, because you might know it as, as Google's PageRank algorithm. You look at every web page and make each link into a directed edge, and then you, you randomly give everything a ranking and then iterate these, these eigenvalue computations, you get numbers that really strongly correlate with how many people visit the page and how important the page is to the, 
the web community. So, so what I did was I, I tried to do the analogous thing um, for the Sage class graph, and the results were actually pretty cool. Um, so if you're looking for the maximum eigenvalue of this graph, it's four. Um, and curiously enough, the only eigenvalues I got were 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, so I found the first eigenvector that had 4 as an eigenvalue. And I looked at the vector, and okay, most so of the entries were 0. All the eigenvalues happen to be integers? Yeah, yeah, not negative integers. Um, Is there some a priori reason that would ever happen for a graph? I just don't understand um, eigenvalues of graphs. I was actually surprised that they were even real, because it's a digraph. So uh -huh. the matrix isn't symmetric. So there must be some reason, though. Seems kind of weird because the graph's somewhat the random. The, the Kirchhoff matrix for the... Oh, okay. That's right, because it's not just the adjacency matrix, it's Kirchhoff. Not That's negative real numbers. Okay. Okay, right. but why are, why are they integers? Because, I mean, the graph is basically random, so... Yeah. Why are they... Um, it is a tree. It's almost, yeah. Yes. There aren't circular reports. Right. Okay. Uh, so maybe that's why they're integers? Is there some theorem? Maybe. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so anyway, I looked for the, 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 the eigenvectors with the largest eigenvalues, and I looked at their non-zero positions. Um, and this is just one example, but I think it's pretty convincing, because the things you get are object, sage object, element, ideal. And I think these get used a lot um, all over the place. And this is sort of like a graph theoretic like, data that supports that. Um, and the degrees of these things are actually, some of them are very high degree, like objects. Everything inherits from object and sage object, but um, some of these other ones are probably just very connected with what we do. Um, we must do a lot with multi-polynomial ideas. Or this particular eigenvector does a lot with polynomial ideas. OK, so let's, let's go back to graph, uh, more basic graph theory. Um, I'll skip over the genus for now, because it's so basic. Um, so there aren't very many computer science majors here, right? Mm. Yeah, there are. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember hearing that the majority were, were in math couple, but you've probably heard of a breadth-first search. Um, so if you look at a graph, um, you can you can view it as a topological space too. You can view it as like something with geometry, but the geometry isn't very interesting. Um, you can just embed it in some space. You know, you can embed any graph in R3, and then just take the, the topology induced from there. Um, but the idea is that you can tell whether a graph is connected or not as this, this topological space, purely in terms of whether there's a path from one vertex to another. That's obvious, right? But um, if a graph is connected, um, you know. so if you have a connected graph, um, something that you often want to compute is what's called a spanning tree. So that's just a tree that's a subgraph of the graph that hits every vertex. So in some sense, you're not losing any of the vertices, but there are less edges to worry about. Um, so there are, there are different ways that you can, you can uh, get a spanning tree. One of them is a breadth-first search. The other is a depth-first search. By their names, you can guess what they're doing. With a breadth-first search, you start at a vertex, which you just pick arbitrarily, and you hit all of the neighbors first. So, so far so good, that's what I did. Um, then, for each of those neighbors, after you've, you've already put those into the tree, you generate uh, their neighbors, and so on. With the depth first search, it's the opposite way. You find one neighbor, and you go as far as you can go until there aren't any neighbors you haven't already hit, and then you come back. Um, so, a depth first search is, is skinnier and longer, breadth first search is smaller and shorter. So, um, Here's a, a question. Um, which is better if you want to minimize the number of edges that you traverse along the tree? One vote for depth first. Red edges. Red first. Red number red. No matter what your tree is, it's, the edges are one less than the number of vertices. So it doesn't actually make a difference. Yeah. Um, however, there are still advantages to breadth first over depth first. So. Um, so here's an example. Um, so, so I mentioned subgraph before, but let's make that a little bit more um, exact. A subgraph is just a graph that embeds into another graph. So there's a homomorphism into there that's injective on the vertices. Um, 
that means that every edge actually gets sent to its own edge and you don't get overlaps. Um, so it's just like a sub any other mathematical object that you would think about. Um, a cycle is a graph with valency two. So it's just some number of edges connected in a circle. Um, the girth of a graph is the minimal number, or it's the minimal size of a cycle. And if it doesn't have any cycles, you say that the girth is infinite. You don't say that the girth is two. If the girth were allowed to be two for any graph, it would be for all graphs with any edges on them, right? Because that's a cycle. Um, so I think G is still the Peterson graph here. And I calculate its girth, and the girth is five. So looking at the, the Peterson graph, what that means is that there are no triangles and no squares, right? No cycles of uh, other lengths. Um, but this is a pretty good example of how to use a, a breadth-first search in a non-trivial way. Um, it also kind of, I'm of the opinion that breadth-first and depth-first search aren't like things that you have as functions themselves. They're just algorithms you know about and you use them in other places. Because every time you use it, you're using it for different things and you need to do different things as you traverse. And it's really much more useful to just know about and to have mm -hmm. written as a function. So how many different implementations of breadth-first and um, depth-first search did you write? In Sage? Probably just one, because I don't think cool. I actually worked, wrote the function breadth first search, but, but there is sort of a breadth first search knitted into, into Girth. So um, this isn't too complicated of an, of an algorithm. I think it's a really good example of the kind of things that you come across a lot in graph theory. So um, let's say that we have a graph that we want to compute the Girth of. So how are you going to do that? Um, you're looking for cycles of minimal size, right? So you automatically, just, just as a human being looking at it, you see a cycle of five. So you know that the girth is at most five. Um, so in this sense, what we're trying to do is prove that the girth is five. So the first thing you do is just write down the vertices in some order. Um, then the idea is I keep track of the, the size of the cycle, the, the smallest size of a cycle that I've seen so far, because I'm, that's what I'm trying to minimize. And I, I iterate along each vertex. So supposing I'm at some vertex that I haven't started from before, what I'm looking for are cycles that hit that vertex. So I do a breadth first search. Because I'm looking for shortest cycles, I don't want them to get long and then connect them eventually. I want them to be fat and connected as soon as possible. So if I'm doing a breadth first search, and I know that the, the smallest cycle I've seen so far is n, I only need to go down a depth of n over 2, right? Because I'm looking for a cycle of at most that size. Um, so as I go through each vertex, I do a breadth first search. And as soon as I find a cycle of smaller length, I stop. And if I get to the length that I already know about, I stop. And once I've done all of the vertices but two, I know that any other cycle that's in there I've already looked at. So I don't, I don't even look at 8 and 9. Um, so that's basically what this is doing. G.relabel just takes, forgets about the labels of the vertices and, and makes them integers. Um, so best is n plus 1 to start, because there is no cycle of n plus 1. So we just interpret that as infinity. And every time we find, where is it? Every time we find a new one, we just update best. So. Um, another, another example of where a breadth-first search is used is in computing the chromatic number of a graph. Can you stop the oh, sure. trees? Or you one? Sorry. I, I just iterate over each one and then I, I do a breadth-first search in each vertex. Um, so let's actually, actually, let's keep looking at this. Let's try to find where, where is the breadth-first search. So here I'm iterating over all the vertices except for the last two. Can anyone see it? You're like, at what point in the code do you suddenly start going and doing the search part? Yeah, I mean, here, I'm doing a search for each one of these, so. I won't 
no. they are hanging in uncomfortable silence. Leave them um, hanging in uncomfortable silence. Until look, look at look at next <laughs> list in this list and see what happens. It's, it's, uh, pretty short. Okay, so the chromatic number. Um, if you recall, I was talking about graph colorings here before. So the rule is that uh, no edge can have the same color on both ends of it. So the chromatic number of a graph is the smallest number for which there's an smallest number n for which there's an n coloring. And n coloring is just an assignment of colors to um, an assignment of n colors to all the vertices such that no edge has the same color. Um, so I think G is still the Peterson graph. Its chromatic number is three. So you can see a three coloring here, maybe badly because of the projector, but um, the primary colors so it's not that bad. Um, I got that coloring from the graph coloring module, um, written by Tom Boothby. Um, you can also define a chromatic polynomial. So for a given n, you can ask whether or not there's an n coloring of the graph. You can also ask how many there are. And it turns out that since you know, the number of n for which there's an n coloring on a graph is between 1 and n. If there are no edges, there's a one coloring. Um, and you can't put more than n colors on the graph. So that means that the data that takes n to the number of colorings is finitely specified. So in particular, you can pack it into a polynomial. You can say that function is a polynomial. And that's what the chromatic polynomial is. So, um, so here, I'm just going over the first few i, because after a while, the number of n colorings function gets pretty slow. But you can see that you know, the number of n colorings in the, the polynomial evaluated it. Nice. So, how long does it take to compute the chromatic polynomial? It's probably cached there, but it's not. It's not cached. No, it doesn't okay. need to. Be. I kind of meant more like complexity. Uh, well, so it's recursive. What you do, actually um, this leads into what I was going to talk about next. Anyway, oh, sorry. So, um, given a graph. You pick out an edge on a graph. So let's say we're looking at this edge. So what can you say about the number of colorings of this graph versus the number of colorings of this graph minus this edge versus the colorings, the number of colorings of this graph with this edge contracted? So when you contract an edge, you basically delete the edge and then identify the vertices. And if you have a common neighbor to both, you just make that one edge instead of two. So um, the observation that the algorithm is based on is that the number of colorings of the graph with this edge in there means you're not allowed to have the same color here. So if you delete the edge, then you're allowed to have the same color there. But when you contract them, then they have to have the same color. So you subtract the one from the other. So the, the number of colorings of n colorings for this graph is the number of n colorings for this graph minus the edge minus the number of colorings of the contraction. So, so what the chromatic polynomial algorithm basically does is it takes a spanning tree of this. Um, I think it's a Bradford search, but I don't think it matters as much for this one. Um, and then what it does is for, for every remaining edge, it recursively computes what happens when you delete the edge, and then computes what happens when you um, identify the, the endpoints of the edge. And so, the more edges in your graph, I think, the more complicated it is because it's recursing on that number of things in sort of a binary way. Um, but that's basically how it's done. And the, the current Sounds implementation kind of, I got from. So, wait, if you give it a graph with a hundred or a thousand vertices, are you pretty much in trouble? I don't think or so. Or not? It's hard for um, me to tell from what you well, said. Well, it's, it's written, it's a pretty shallow recursion, and it's written in pure Cython. And uh -huh. It's based on the fastest algorithm in the world um, that I know about. So. Oh. Let's give it a try. So, <laughs> well, you don't have to do it. You could do so. well. <laughs> you could have we'll done something smaller. You might never find out. It's in Cython too, so it's not oh. a block. And you didn't use SIGON SIGOFs.
I'm surprised. What? That would, that would be faster. Um, I mean, for graphs of reasonable size, it's it's surprisingly fast. Um, at least based on where we were coming from, which was just you know go through every n and compute all of the n colorings of that. <laughs> so, you know, that's like an NP-complete problem times n. I mean, I get the impression that something like the number of somethings factorial in complexity. Um, I mean, it is the graph. I mean, not the random graph on the vertices. Is, is it going to be close to being like a k one hundred? That would be horrible. No, no it depends one. on the p that you give it because you can. So, okay, so normally when you define a random graph, there's lots of different ways to do it. You can say, okay, take all of the equivalence classes of graphs and uniformly pick one of those. Or you can say, throw in n vertices, and then for each possible edge, throw in that edge with a certain probability. So GNP um, is, the, is the latter. So I'm saying, throw in 100 vertices, and then for each possible edge, throw in a, an edge with probability 1 tenth. Okay, so you have low probability. Yeah, so it's... it's um, I think it actually gets a lot worse as you get dense, but um, you know, certain things, I mean, you know the number of colorings of complete graph, things like that. Um, okay, so while we're waiting for that to ever finish or not, um, I, I do have a list of, of project ideas. So um, I know William said something in the email about um, the, the potential of discussing problems. Um, how many people here don't have a project yet? Okay, so there's a few. Um, if you're looking for a problem, there are some, some pretty cool problems in here. Um, and I have leads on all of them, so you wouldn't just be going out into the dark. I could sort of get you set up with that problem. Um, so there's an algorithm. Right now there's something in Sage to generate trees, but it's just a toy implementation based on some other algorithm that's really slow. Yeah. In your graph spectra problem, you could ask oh, those, those, sorry. The, you could ask for uh, the, somebody to try to find the relationship between the spectra of the Kirchhoff matrix and the spectra of the response matrix that corresponds to it if you take a partition of it and the boundary vertices and the interior vertices. Mm -hmm. And there should be something interesting. Yeah. Um, I think that was just an outline of his lecture. Was yeah, these, these are a, these Like the problems are just project. right there. And then spectra is just part of the outline of his lecture. Not an that, actual that would be a good problem. research project. A good but as far as implementing code, it might not. I don't know. It, it might be too hard for uh, the uh, final project for the course. Um, I, I would I would put subgraph isomorphism in there too. But if you're feeling brave uh, and you don't mind getting partial results instead of a complete project, then there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I mean, there's no algorithm that says you do it at all. So even if it was really slow, what is it? Nothing. Subgraph isomorphism. Yeah, I don't even know what you're talking about. Uh, whether or not. This is a subgraph of that, basically. It's not like, ah, I mean, I see. I mean, technically, a subgraph is the vertex set of this graph is a subset of that, and you know, there's under map. that mapping, it's a sub. Yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's an inclusion, but um, subgraph isomorphism is actually NP complete, as well as Hamiltonian cycles. But that's no reason to stop. That that no, yeah. I mean, I've heard so many people, people say, oh, it's. There's, there's no point bothering to compute this because it's NP complete, so don't even bother to write an implementation. It's like, well, doesn't the complexity of something just like tell you how long you should wait for the answer? Like, <laughs> whether or not you should bother to try to get it at all. Um, but so um, graph visualization needs some work uh, by someone who hasn't designed it because I'm sick of looking at it. And, um, you know, it's it's decent, but it needs it needs a lot of bells and whistles. So if, if you like programming bells and whistles, that might be good. Um, when I mentioned in the beginning, there's other kinds of instance structures. There's generalizations of graphs, and then there's other kinds of things like some visual complexes and, and codes and designs and things. And, you know, they're all different kinds of generalizations of graphs, and you could you could do something with those. Um, if you liked DSage. Um, you could look at, at item H, which is basically um, what I just did with the class graph. But the idea is, you know, Google has lots and lots and lots of servers that do this every day. They look, they look through the internet and they basically traverse the graph that is the internet and they compute this eigenvector. And every day they, they update it because new links are created and destroyed and everything. And that's how they get their page rank. And it would be cool if we had sort of a toy implementation of that. Um, if you could just say, you know, okay, I have a computer lab full of computers, and I have a big complicated graph, and, you know, I want to find all the eigenspaces of it. And, you know, I don't know how linear algebra translates to 
two problems like that when it's sparse and you look and you localize. But my guess is that's how Google does it. So maybe that would be a good project too. Um, also for item G, there are some some interesting problems you can ask about related to bipartite graphs. Um, so often it's like the the question is something like you have you know n people over for dinner and n meals or you know they don't want to sit together or they do or you're, you're trying to match seats to people or meals to people or hats to people or something like that and, and those are the kind of problems that you can do with, with bipartite graphs and um, they're all pretty algorithmic. Um, know, that's that's basically all the material I prepared. Um, do you guys have any questions about forever about graphs, graphs and siege? Think about it. You can ask anything about graphs in Sage. Actually, you can almost ask anything about graphs in anything because you look a lot at what other programs do. Maybe you should say a little bit about comparing what Sage does to all the other programs out there. Um, Since we don't want this course to be too Sage centric. Yeah, I guess. Um, so Network X um, is is sort of it's included in Sage. It's open source. It's written in pure Python. Um, it was what we originally based our graph data structures on, although I've written a replacement which is faster, um, just because it's not in Python, because it's compiled. How um, much faster is it? Up to 80 times at certain functions. Somewhere between 20 and 80, depending. I mean, deleting vertices is really slow, because you, I, the way I have it is the vertices are labeled 0 through n minus 1, and you actually have mm -hmm. to rename everything when you delete it. Mm -hmm. It's not really designed so much for deletion. Right. But the, their, their main use is like, okay, add stuff to it, and then ask questions about it. So yeah. um, that's a lot faster. I think deletion is still like twice as fast, though. No, Network X is really good at um, questions about cores and cliques in graph. So finding the maximal cliques in a graph is another MP-complete problem. Um, is your thing the implementation of the graph stuff, so it's faster? Is that compatible with Network X, though? It's pure Cython. Um, it wouldn't be that hard to just, you know, plug it into Network X. But part of the Network X project is that they're pure Python. I'm proud of it. Okay. So um, I don't know. I think there was some discussion between Jason Grout and the Network X people, and it didn't seem to really go very far. And I don't know. I'm kind of Sage centric, so I don't really care. <laughs> so I guess nothing's ever come of it. Um, so Mathematica doesn't really but do much with graphs. Oh, sorry. One thing related to E's question is there are lots of algorithms implemented in Network X, or at least one has that impression, um, such as for clicks and every, so on. So I, maybe, I, I, I think mean, most of the algorithms that are implemented in Network X are, um, are replicated in Sage by now, except for the cliques and cores algorithms, uh -huh. which so are just you, really fast. So if you call those functions, you have to convert the graph into a Python dictionary and then call the Network um, X function on it. Well. As of Sage 3.0, there's still Network X graphs. I've like done everything to abstract it, but then haven't moved not, it over. Not used by so, default yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I mean, normally you just say, okay, what is the Network X graph, and then call it on that. But do you like when you run certain of your algorithms? Do you transform the Network X graph into your graph internally, and then uh, use it that way? For the isomorphism problem, yeah, you have okay, the option between dense or sparse, mm -hmm. and it'll take either one. Right now, it does dense, just because. Which is your? Yeah. Okay. But I think that's the only one. Or, uh, most of the other ones just sort of call the has edge mm -hmm. functions and things like that. Yeah? Um, is there anything to do with the flow, the flow? Not at all, actually. Um, max flow min cut would be a great project, too, something like that. Um, so the max flow min cut is this, this famous problem uh, for networks. Again, viewing it as kind of electrical networks or, or you know, Things that actually represent real things moving around, where you want to have the maximum amount of movement with the minimum amount of interference. So that's sort of what the maximum cut is. It's kind of an optimization flavor problem. Um, but no, we haven't focused on any of that because my interests in graph theory are um, algebraic, and so that's what I've worked on. Um, and we have had some other people start working on graphs more too. Um, I should give Emily credit because she like worked on it. Year two. Who are all the graph people involved in Sage? Um, involved. Well, there's me, Emily, um, Jason Grout, um, Tom. Tom's done some stuff with graphs. He's, he's shaking his hand because he doesn't want people to ask him questions. No, I'm not sure. 
Um, we can we can boast Chris Godsell as a as a Sage Graph user. Um, he sends lots of nice bug reports and, and finds problems in my isomorphism program. He's a big he name in the field. He wrote a book that's very influential. Um, I actually just visited um, him and the other author of that book, um, Gordon Royal, in, in Waterloo, and that was a lot of fun. Um, we basically spent the week just talking about common Which book are you talking about? Algebraic Graph Theory. So, um, what do they think of graphs in Sage? Um, well, here's one thing that happened that I really liked. Uh, Gordon Royal was asking about um, polynomials in Sage over the integers because he's interested in chromatic polynomials. And the problem he was having was that he was trying to get his chromatic polynomial code to interface nicely with uh, polynomial factorization programs. Huh. And it was difficult because, you know, the, you have to push data around and um, there are all these bugs in these programs that he was using. Um, so I sat him down with Sage and I, you know, I asked him, so what do you want to know? And he's like, well, okay, uh, take this random polynomial, um, you know, how does it factor? And I showed him how it factored and he just went, wow, I, I'll, I'll, I'll look into using Sage now. <laughs> just sort of, I, I think it's a pretty general thing. Where, like, Was people, it a univariate polynomial uh, or multivariate? So. Wow. So. Huh. Yeah, Sage's univariate polynomial factorization is very, very good. I, I guess it's sort of a general theme, right? Like people have problems with all these different little open source programs that do just what they want, and you know, Sage tries to work around that problem by giving a unified interface to everything. You can just say, give me the polynomial, give me the roots, and it does it, and it does it fast. That was pretty cool. Speaking of which, did the chromatic polynomial calculation ever finish that we started? <laughs> 10 minutes ago? Or no, it hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is, uh, it is based on sort of the, the quickest routine to do so. Uh, so this is giving a sense of, this is giving no yeah. useful information, except I'm now scared of chromatic polynomials as terribly hard things to compute. Which you should, because they're MPP. OK. You should run genus. Can we just try smaller values? Them. Yeah. Can we try a few smaller values than 100, such as 10? Like 10 shouldn't take long. OK. And then like 15 or 20. Wow. So it just gets really big suddenly. Wow. Hmm, that's scary. Apparently you could be misled by small values. Huh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is, this is kind of indicative of, of, of an NP problem. Is it? I see. It's not like linear algebra. Wow. Is that really what, I mean, from your point of view, that's kind of what an NP complete problem feels like? It's well, somehow trivial, 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 and possibly hard. And then boom. Well, 0 0.00, 0 0.00, <laughs> I mean, you've all seen that the hierarchy of complexity I, n I never really think of NP complete like that, but wait, did it crash? Oh, you quit it, I see. So what I'm interested in is, is graph isomorphism. Um, and there's this whole class of problems that are equivalent to graph isomorphism under the same equivalences that you use for polynomial and non-polynomial time classes. And all we know is that P is a subset of GI, and GI is a subset of NP. Nobody knows where to draw the line or whether they're equivalent. I think people in general think that they're all distinct. Like there's there's some like graph isomorphism isn't polynomial time, and I think that you know Hamiltonian cycles aren't graph isomorphism time, things like that. Um, but what I've heard is that the sort of the, the easiest way to tell whether you're in GI or in NP is whether or not it's easy or hard to come up with hard examples. Like for NP, just all of a sudden, boom, you can't do it anymore. But for for graph isomorphism in particular, you can come up with all these families of graphs that have their own particular polynomial when you look at the runtimes. So it's just that there are different polynomials and some of them are steeper than others and um, yeah, it's really hard to come up with something that, I mean, graph isomorphism takes a while, but as a function of the size of the input, it doesn't seem to be sort of innately, it's not guaranteed hard, whereas NP problems seem to be pretty much guaranteed hard. But I mean, anytime you do combinatorics, hardness is all about the, the sudden wall because everything's. I mean, 
the meaning of the phrase combinatorial explosion means something like two to the k to the n. You know, for some fixed n, as k grows, it means it's n. But, um, uh, graphs are fun. They make they make for fun projects. You should think about it. Okay. Any other um, questions or comments? Didn't you say everything is a graph isomorphism <coughs> problem? Every problem in algebra is a graph isomorphism or automorphism problem. Don't you? Um, there are some uh, group theory questions that can be that are graph isomorphism equivalent. Huh. Um, but uh, I'd say I mean it seems like a lot of problems in linear algebra are polynomial. But I'll be working this summer on sort of implementing a lot of group theory algorithms based on the graph isomorphism program, so. Funded by Google. <laughs> they Funded generously yeah. by Google. Thank you, Google. Thanks, right. Google. <laughs> right, so let's thank um, Robert for <laughs> Right, so let's just stop um, three minutes early, and I'll see you all on Monday.